consider this your invitation. Me, your MC, and Bumblebee the host, because ladies, gents, and all kind of guests, today's video is the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome. Be sure to RSVP, because we want to get started. First up at number 10, let's talk about the horrid Roman wedding colors. I mean, they have you out here looking like a Mick bride. I'm talking happy meal. Whoever decided that egg yolk yellow must have been the move, must have hated Romans or women or both. So, to paint y'all a picture, the night before her wedding, having given away her childhood dolls, a Roman girl might sleep in a tunca reca, a special white woolen robe she has to have woven herself to demonstrate her domestic skills. If you, let's say, sucked at domestic skills, you'd essentially be wearing like a pillowcase with no arms type of thing. So, on the morning of the wedding day, the bride is dressed by her mother, and everything she wore has to be cream or a yellow wool. It's the only material harvested from an animal while it's still alive, thus it contained animus, aka spirit. This must seem an absolutely brazenly stupid material choice given the Mediterranean climate, but keep in mind it was fun to be supremely Aryan-like. That doesn't make it any less chafy though, so. On to the egg yolk, aka flamium. The flame colored or color of egg yolk veil used to cover the bride's hair and shielded her face. It signaled the transition into a matron's pala, a huge rectangular shawl worn by wedded women. But before you slap that rain poncho on her head, don't forget to do the elaborate Sunny Creens hairstyle. What's that mean in English? Intercourse Creens. It's six special braids wound with a bunch of fragrance herbs to do with fertility, but also covers the fact people were smelly. Don't worry. You add more cotton this time to her hair in colorful strips. Last but not least, like your daughter is a present under the tree, you tie her up in a bow. More accurately, a cingulum. It's a wool belt tied with something called a Hercules knot that her husband has to be competent enough to undo on the wedding night. Toss on a pair of neon yellow slippers and you're ready to go down the aisle looking like a crumpled napkin covered in mustard. Let's go. So, marriage required giving up a lot of yourself, including your girlhood. Number nine is Bye Bye Barbie. As we all know, girls were married off while still young. But to give you like the smallest semblance of peace, many Roman emperors upheld and enforced that consummation wasn't allowed despite a marriage occurring until a woman reached a certain age. Just to ensure they didn't die unnecessarily and childbirth was a major 50-50 back then. Some women were genuinely barred from giving birth well into their 20s if their family had a bad rep of lady deaths. But the night before a wedding, no matter what happened once the knot was tied, pun intended, and no matter her age, a girl set aside dolls, old hairbrushes, and dresses and donned in matronly garb for the first time and ceremoniously burnt her old items. By dedicating her toys and useful possessions to the household gods, it became a transition in which she would emerge a woman. Even if you're like 20, you had to do this. I'm sure it didn't have to go as far as burning it, like sheesh, maybe save them for when you have a kid of your own, that way you don't have to remake and rebuy all the stuff again. Or find like a prehistoric value village to donate to, maybe. And while we're giving things away, why don't you take a second and scroll on down to the red button below so you can subscribe to the hive. Now as mentioned, Roman emperors had some more really than a little say in marriage. So number eight is all about how it was governed by law. There were very specific laws governing marriage, and these laws evolved depending on the era, the emperor in control, and then when Christianity entered the empire. Pretty consistently, a proper Roman marriage could not take place unless the bride and the groom were Roman citizens or had been granted special permission called a conibium. So more on the laws around that in a later point. At one time in Roman history, those who had been owned people, now freed, were forbidden to marry citizens. This restriction was relaxed by an Emperor Augustus who passed a reform in 18 BC called the Lex Julia, so that by the first century, freed peoples were only prohibited from marrying senators. Augustus instead insisted on other restrictions on marriage. Citizens weren't allowed to marry working girls or actresses, and provincial officials were not allowed to marry local women. Soldiers were only allowed to marry in certain circumstances, and marriages to close relatives were forbidden. Finally, unfaithful wives divorced by their husbands could not remarry. In the Republic, there was a stipulation that if the bride is uh, not deflowered, her husband should only sleep beside her for at least one night without engaging in physical touch. The aim of that was to give women a chance to get used to a new situation. Another thing meant to help her get used to a new situation, number seven, the mutinas tutinas. So we know about this tradition through some very, very angry church fathers and their many documented temper tantrums. One famous account is Christian apologist Arnubus, who angrily scribbled that the Roman matrons were taking 
taken for a ride on Tutinus with its immense shameful part. In reality, what he's actually describing with a lot of hostility and hypocrisy as an obscene loss of purity was actually a ritual that allowed brides to have autonomy and learn not to be embarrassed by the act of intercourse and their body's role in it, in an era where that didn't get to happen. So stop being mad bro, it can't always be about men. The ritual goes that before the consummation of her marriage, a Roman woman had to go through the process of deflowering herself. In order to do that, she made her way to the temple of Mutinus and the marriage deity and sat on his appendage. She didn't have to do more than a quick sit. If she didn't want to, it was up to the woman. Someone had to do the sit down, ouch, okay, time to get up and leave, got lots of wedding planning to do, while other women would you know? So whatever kind of woman you are, once you walked out of that temple, albeit now a little bit bow-legged, you were also now able to have proper relations with your new husband. And a deity being your first penetration would guarantee fertility and healthy children. As also mentioned previously, their society aimed for women not to have relations on the first night anyways, and rather sleep beside their husband. Unfortunately, both these practices degenerated and took women's rights with them. We've done a lot of build up to it, so let's make number six all about how Roman weddings have one wacky ceremony. First of all, a marriage ceremony was commonly held, although there was actually no legal requirement for such. In law, all that was required was for the bride to be led to the groom's house. The groom did not have to show up. He could quite literally be wed in absentasia via a letter of intent. There's some confusion about which rituals relate to which types of marriage and from what time periods, seeing as there was three kinds of marriage and a lot of different eras of the Roman Empire. Purchase, which is the usual, it's always existed. Usage super archaic, where a man and woman could spend a year together unmarried, do whatever they want, and once it's hit the one year point, if the woman stays another three days, they're officially married. Then one last came into play later in the empire, and that was alongside Christianity. It had a religious character involved. In earlier times, either a lamb was sacrificed and its skin spread out for the bride to sit on, or a sow was sacrificed to Mother Earth. Either route, an auspex read the entrails to determine the fate of the couple. Then the bride unveiled herself, power move, and the couple stood face to face. In later times, when vows were introduced, she would say, where you are the male, I am the female, and he would respond, ubi tu gaia, ego gaios. Rings or coins were then given to the bride. A contract was signed if it was desired, like a prenup agreement today. Both families could stipulate terms around children and in finances, such as a dowry. The Roman marriage ceremony, called a dextratum incutio, literally means joining of hands. The last component found in all times of the empire was a handshake that signifies the concordia, a mutual bond of affection between the married couple using their right hands. The couple then share a ritual spell cake that the groom broke above the bride's head, not like a bottle style, in a let me crumble this above your elaborate hairstyle to feed your head lice kind of way. And then after the wedding comes the domum deductio, number five. So it's a big old procession and the most important part of the wedding day, signifying a public acknowledgement of the wedding. The procession could begin at the bride's family's hearth with a ritual where she would be pulled from her mother's arms and a demonstration of the bride modesty and sadness of leaving the family home. The entire procession then paraded to the groom's house and the bride specifically was escorted by three younger men, one carrying a torch and the other two would be holding her arms. They are followed by the pranuba, five white pine torches that are carried to honor Cerces, an earth fertility goddess. The bride then has a bouquet of distaffs or spindles to nod to her duty as a wool maker for the family. Then would come the couple's friends and family behind them. Anyone else could join the procession and many people did just for fun, all while throwing candied nuts at the bride. The groom received the bride at the door, which she entered with the distaff and spindle in hand. And at the threshold, the bride adorned the doorway post with the fat of a pig to honor Cerces, the fat of a wolf to honor Rome, and then remember those raw wool strips all up in her hair? They get added to the door too. After she's finished her arts and craft project, the husband would present her the household keys. In pagan times, she'd do a consent chant, then he'd sweep her up and carry her in the doorway since tripping was a bad omen. Guests were invited in for a meal and only left when it was time to undo Hercules' knot. Like levels in a video game, now it's the bedroom door, the groom presents the bride fire and water, the elements of the household maintenance, the bride touches each, and then her husband would undo the knot, even if fortification wasn't to occur, and just like that, you're married. And you may be wondering how to congratulate the happy couple. Well, don't worry, because that's number four in the countdown, so as mentioned, if you're
you're hanging around in a procession, whether part of the wedding party or just an everyday Joe, you get to hug handfuls of dried candied fruits and nuts at the bride. Walnuts were most popular for this, which I feel would be the worst kind of nut to get stuck in your hair, but maybe getting a dried apricot thrown at you and bouncing off your cranium isn't much better either. As I'm sure you can tell, this was the cultural precursor to throwing rice, confetti, and bits of paper, which probably resulted in fewer brides with eye injuries. As an attendee, you can yell feliciter, which means good luck, or talisio, which even in the times of the late republic was an archaic word. There were most definitely obscene songs. Naturally, they were sung by men and children in the procession on my personal favorite, this little hand sign. This is Manofico, representing good luck, fertility, protection from the evil eye. However, in modern Italian culture, it's evolved into an intercourse based insult, so don't go busting it out at weddings. Now here's a question I've heard a few times, and I love answering stuff. So who can marry who is number three. If you went back in time and asked a Roman their perspective on interracial marriage, they'd be so confused by your question, they'd probably miss the fact that you're wearing Air Maxes. Fun fact kids, but most of those ancient worlds didn't have a racial categories. A Briton and a Syrian? African and Romanian? Caribbean and Native American? What's Latin for whatever's yo? Because they didn't regard such things as fundamentally wrong the way that modern crappy people can. The evidence seems to show that ethnicity played a little part once a group was Romanized. If they acted, dressed, and behaved as a Roman, then to most, they were a real Roman. That meant you could marry another Roman. Don't even ask me about same-sex relationships because those were laughably normal. But hear what I mentioned, Roman and Roman. That's because the big Roman taboo was class mixing. A great example is how a barbarian and a Roman citizen couldn't marry, not on the grounds of race mixing or same genders, but actually on pure legality. Marriage had to be between two Roman Empire citizens. Barbarians, who were anyone living in the regions around Rome but not part of the Roman Empire, did not have conubium, which is aka the right to specifically marry Roman citizens. This applied to even the Greeks, who were held above the other barbarians for being similar enough to the Romans. If a marriage between a Germanic and a Roman tried or did successfully happen, man, y'all could be beige, pink, black, green, blue, boys, girls, all in between. It's a scandal. One that could be subjected to a court case or even a death sentence. Let's talk about number two, the Roman divorce. Prior to the late Republic, divorce was virtually unknown. Changes in marriage laws allowed for women to keep control of her dowry, and this made divorce and self-sustenance more viable option for women. And it was also simple, just so simple. Just as a marriage was only a declaration of intent to live together, as mentioned, really all that's necessary is a procession to the groom's house, divorce was just a declaration of the couple's intent not to live together. All that law required was that they declare their wish to divorce before seven witnesses. An ex-wife could expect to receive her dowry back in full and then return to her father's possession. If she'd been independent before the wedding, i.e. orphan freed woman, she would regain her independence. Under the Lex Julia, founded by Augustus, a wife found guilty of adultery in special court might sacrifice the return of half her dowry, and it allowed her dad to kill her, or just about any man, really creepy. Divorce for infertility, always assumed to be the woman's fault, was valid given that bearing children was pretty much the point of the marriage thing, and also political advancement was another valid reason for divorce. In the late Republic, Cato the Younger divorced his wife Marcia so that she could marry someone else and he could forge links with the orator Quintus Horentius, the only way he could climb in rank. Cato loved Marcia and missed her deeply, so when Horentius dies a few years later, Cato was now a high ranking man and remarried his now very rich ex wife. The last and the craziest on the list is number one. Where did it all come from? All these traditions, all these centuries. Roman weddings have had some of the most influence on traditions we still have today. Even the language, like tying the knot. But I have to come to bear some horrible, horrible origins for all of these traditions. The taking of Sabine women. The story is set when the village of Rome was first established in 753 BCE. Its population was almost entirely men, with only a small handful of already married women who are now too scared to leave their home. So what's the answer to prehistoric evil men? Steal women of childbearing age from the neighboring township of Sabine. These girls are then forced into marriages through physicality. So when their fathers and brothers and previous husbands come to wage war and retrieve their women, the women are now mothers and throw themselves between the evil men who are now the fathers of their children and then the men who they'd been stolen from, their family. Historians say this is because women supposedly felt so much guilt over the bloodshed that started in their names. They wanted to live neither fatherless nor widowed. So a truce is called, and the Sabines and the Romans unite their community. There's a lot to be said here about motives for consent, notions of honor and family, female trauma, and the history being very obviously written by a man. So for now, let's focus on the fact that many Roman weddings 
refer to this legendary empire shaping event. The hairstyle of six braids, it's parted with a spearhead to represent the violent capture of the Sabines, pulling the daughter from her mother's arms, and her family taking her away in a procession to her new husband's home. Women carried across the threshold to avoid tripping a bad omen. It's a reference to Sabine women being forcibly carried or dragged into their captors' homes. Plutarch gave more explanation to the meaning of that wedding word, Talisio, including the fact that it's the name of one of the Sabine abductors and wool related. Thus, all the wool necessary in the wedding and the scraps being left around his front door. All of these traditions are incorporated into ancient Roman weddings after the atrocity united communities to try and ritualize the event that joined the two nations and create a bond from it, rewriting the tragedy into unity and celebration. And now, we still do some of these things today. Alrighty, that's the end of another video. I sure hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us. And until next time, drop some comments down below on what kind of wedding traditions you may have incorporated or plan to incorporate into your wedding.